Welcome to From Potential to Powerhouse, success secrets from female leaders, where female trailblazers share their journeys and the aha moments that made all the difference with your host, serial entrepreneur and trailblazer herself, Tracy Holland. So Elizabeth, um, welcome today to From Potential to Powerhouse. I'm so thrilled to have you. You've had an incredible career as a powerhouse female. I look forward to having you share with everyone today uh, a lot around how you built your business, how you built your career, where you started, where you were inspired. Um, One of the things that I found so inspiring about you is not only have you had this incredible career, but then you also have such a passion for helping others while finding a way to make a profitable investment or look at profitable opportunities to also make an impact. And I've learned so much from you on what that means, especially around homelessness. And I want to dig into Dignity Capital. Um, But I wanted to introduce everyone today to Elizabeth Funk, who lives in the Bay Area. And we're going to have a great conversation about some of the ways that she's not only become such an incredible powerhouse woman and business leader herself, but the ways in which she's making impact on people right now all over the world and here in the United States um, in some of the investments and um, initiatives that she's working on. So welcome. Thank today. you. Yes, thank you. So I kind of love to start just for everyone who listens because everyone wants to understand, were you born a powerhouse? Did you have a vision for this when you were born? What was, What were you like as a kid? So. Give me a little bit of an insight, if we could, you know, hindsight back to you as a three, five, seven, 10, 14 year old uh, girl, what, what was Elizabeth Funk like? Were you entrepreneurial? Were you a tough kid? Were you a good listener? Were you great in school? Give us, give us a little overview. The most important thing about me as a, as a young woman was I was an ice skater. I loved, I was a a figure skater and I loved, I didn't do team sports. I loved the independence of being on the ice. I wasn't all that good technically, but I loved the speed and I loved the power and I loved sort of the the creativity and and self-expression. It was a, a real passion of mine. So I was very dedicated to it. I would get up, my coach would pick me up at five in the morning and I would skate when I had the ice to myself for an hour and a half or two before before school every day. Um, so I was a little bit independent uh, in that regard. I wasn't I wasn't in the the groups as much. I had a, you know I had a group of good girlfriends, but um, was really was really passionate about this sort of self expression. And I think um, there's a lot about ice skating that is that has transitioned in my in my life. That sort of independence and self expression and creativity. So did you have a trainer? Were you up at 6 a.m. on the ice? And I'm imagining, you know, these women who get up and are pre-Olympians, you know, who are constantly working out, you know, working hard, doing their flips and tricks and, you know, all of that discipline. Is that, was that you or were you seeing it more as a creative expression? So that was me in the sense that I was getting up at, at five in the morning and, and going, going to the ice with my, with my coach. Um, and I did summer camps that were ice and I did some competitions, um, but it was, I didn't ever aspire that I was going to be an Olympian. It was really sort of my sport and it was the thing that I, that I loved putting. And, and it was something that was unique enough that I had something that I, that was, could really be mine that mm. not everybody else was doing. And were you a a kid who got good grades? Were you, did you have a great relationship with your parents or were you a little bit on the rebellious side? So my mom was a single mom. And uh, so therefore she and I were incredibly close. And I think that I got great, I did get great grades. Academics came fairly easy to me, but I think a lot of it was because I wanted to, uh, to, to live up to her expectations. I wanted to, to, I knew that what she was doing was really hard. And I felt, I think, um, inherently an obligation or a desire to be a good kid and to impress her. Um, mm. And we were a really close team. So was it just the two of you? My brother as well. 
Okay. Uh, but he had stayed fairly close to my, my, my dad. Um, and my mom and I were, were the two that were at the house most of the time and, and we were really close. And did it make an impact? How old were you when they split? I was in third grade. Okay. And I was never very close to my dad. My dad had not prioritized family. It was one of the reasons why my mom decided it wasn't a good match. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't a real loss for me. And in fact, to the contrary, she started dating a man pretty quickly who became my stepdad and really raised me for you know the, the, the last 40 years mm -hmm. and who is wonderful. He and I are so close. And even now that my mom has passed, he and I have stayed very close. He's been really my foundation through a lot of my life. And uh, so I don't feel like I lost out on having a father. Mm -hmm. I had an amazing father figure. Amazing. That's so I had a similar situation with my mother on my, you know, my, I have a stepmom who I call mom. So that has, that's relationship is one of my most important relationships, you know, and I have a wonderful like, story to tell about, about him, which is when I, I grew up in Kansas city and I wanted, I was invited to do the debutante ball, uh, which in Kansas city was a big deal. And one of the requirements was that you had to do waltz lessons with your father for six weeks straight every Thursday night. And um, so I went and asked my dad if he would do this with me, my real dad. And he said, no, he was, it was hunting season and hunting was more important to him. So I came home in tears and sat with my mom and her boyfriend and, you know, I'm never going to be a debutante. No, my life is over and my crisis. And he was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. He was undersecretary of commerce. And, um, and he said, well, honey, if you'd let me, I'll do it. And I said, you can't do it. You live in Washington, D.C. And he said, no, I'll do it for you. And for six weeks in a row, every Thursday, he flew to Kansas City, did waltz lessons with me, and then took a red eye back. And mm. we were waltzing at the debutante ball. I thanked him so much. And he said, he said, honey, I have to tell you something. I already knew how to waltz. <laughs> I have goose skin. But he that was, is such, I mean, you know, it's like those moments um, that are pivotal. Mm. Right. It's just like showing up. Yes. And I'm sure that that's why you're such an amazing mom. Right. Is that you also know what it feels like to have a busy life and to be a hard driving professional and figure out how to make time for both. Mm. Right. Because we know what that feels like. I've always really prioritized being there for my children. And it's been a real balance when I was, you know, my early in my career, I could be an entrepreneur and you know, sleep under my desk, not go home at night because I was just myself and independent. Um, but then when I, you know, when I had kids, I made lifestyle decisions and became an investor so that I didn't have to be in an office every day. And I, you know, could be, uh, be present and be working from home. And now as my kids are older, I'm going you know, to probably be back into operating roles. So I've always had my children as a filter and being able to be present for them as one of the decision factors in what I'm doing career-wise. And so when you were in high school transitioning into college, give us, an, give us some insight into what that was like. Did you decide right away, I want to go to college? Was your mom kind of talking to you all along about what your career path was going to be? Or what, where, where did you, how did you go from Kansas City to Microsoft? Yeah, so um, from Kansas City, I, I was really strong academically. And my mom did have expectations that I would, um, you know, go to the best college that I could get into. And, and so I wasn't looking locally. I was mostly looking on the East coast, um, and, you know, applied to Yale and Dartmouth and, you know, the big schools. Um, but I applied to Stanford and when I toured, <laughs> I was sold California driving down the Palm drive with the palm trees and the sun. And, um, I, I knew in my heart, I was a California girl. So totally. I came to Stanford and uh, I never looked back. I've never looked back in Kansas City. That's amazing. So you went to Stanford undergrad, you got great grades. And as you're, in, what was your undergrad major? So I was a double major in economics and international relations. Okay. I was IR too, foreign <laughs> policy. I love that. Um, and so as you're in college, were you ambitious? Were you doing internships? Were you thinking about your career or were you just kind of having a great time or both? 
I was doing some of both. I was doing yeah. some of both. Um, there was a, you know, an idea or two where we were tinkering around with some friends about starting little businesses, but uh, mostly focused on, on, on having a great time. Yeah. Okay. And then graduating, what was first phase professional? So um, I, my first job was at Microsoft and Microsoft was, I think very wisely interested in hiring non-techie people to be their product managers. So, which is designing the products to make sure that they work for customers and, and marketing. Uh, and so I was hired to be a product manager for Microsoft Word, which was right when Windows was coming out. And so we were competing against WordPerfect and Wang, which were you know, the black screen and the white text and, um, and, and starting to show what Windows was like and that you could actually see bold on the screen. Uh, so I was a product manager for Microsoft Word and loved it. It was my, uh, you know, it, it was so fun to be at a company that was growing so quickly and, you know, really breaking ground. And then um, within Microsoft and Word, I was responsible for the little um, student pack where we sold Word and Excel together in a bundle. I, 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 was, I was one of your customers <laughs> at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the student pack was the precursor to Microsoft Office. So it was the first time we would sold products together in a box and it was working. And so I was on the founding team of Microsoft Office. Amazing. Okay. And so how long were you there? And was this as your first corporate job, your first job job, your first time in a profession, you know, getting a paycheck? Were you thinking this is satisfying and I'm, I'm liking this? I like the, the large company format. This feels like the right place for me? Or were you realizing as you were there that maybe a shift or a different type of environment was the, a better fit for you? I don't think at that point in my life that I was aware that, uh, that, that, that I would prefer to be in something more entrepreneurial. Um, I enjoyed working with big teams. Um, you know, I, was, I was mostly excited about the innovation and mm -hmm. coming out with new things. Of course, the problem is that in software, especially back then, when software literally shipped on CDs in boxes, the uh, evolution time is 18 months. When you come up with a feature, you have to wait till the next release, which is a year and a half from now. And so it was very slow. Um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed the experience at Microsoft. I had always known that I would go to business school. My father had gone to business school. I had just always had that assumption. And so I was kind of just on an automatic path, which is after four years, that tends to be the right time to go to business school. But I broke up with a boyfriend who I'd been living with and literally like made the decision that week. And I said, it's time. I got to get out of here. I'm going to change places not be in Seattle anymore where there were so many memories and, and, and so forth. And so the application deadline for Stanford and several other schools had already passed, mm -hmm. but the Harvard deadline was still in a week. And so I scrambled and pulled together an application and got into HBS. That's, that's incredible. So how does that, how does someone get into HBS? Can we just pause on that one for a sec? I mean, this is like, this isn't even the one person. I mean, as someone who went to grad school, I, I actually started the process of saying, I really want to go to Harvard. And, and I think I actually believe before I even knew what imposter syndrome was, mm. that I was experiencing it because I thought, I don't think I can compete. I don't think I'm smart enough. I don't, what happens if I, I mean, I'm imagining, you know, just like Nobel Peace Prize winners, like falling out of the front door at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an incredible institution. It's like still, I think in hindsight, I don't have a lot of regrets, but when I think about the fact that I said, yes, I was going to apply. And then I pulled back. I thought, why should I, I mean, really? Like, how do you do that? So when, mm. what was that like? You, you apply for Harvard. Did you expect to get in? Uh, you know, I am an eternal optimist. There's something in me that is wired that I always believe things are going to work out. Um, it's actually served me very well and to some extent not served me well because um, I'm often in, you know, easy to take advantage of because I always believe people are, are good. I'm just sure. fundamentally optimistic. So 
I'm not sure I really doubted. I really felt pretty confident. And my grades have been great at Stanford. And of course, Microsoft was a very interesting career to be applying from. Um, but it worked out. And I loved That's HBS. Amazing. I loved HBS. I met so many great people. Um, and, you know, and it, and it was the time to take a break from tech. I hadn't necessarily decided I wanted to be in tech. And it sort of happened to me. And so taking a bit of a break to give myself some time to um, be away from it and make it a conscious decision. And the conscious decision was absolutely, I want to be in an innovative industry where it's on the front lines of interesting, exciting things. So I knew graduating from Harvard, I wanted to go back into tech. And I also knew I wanted to go back to the Bay Area. I Austin um, and the rain in Seattle, but I also wanted to be at the heart of where it was happening. So I knew I wanted to come back to Silicon Valley. So in terms of the size, and I just want to go back for a sec to Microsoft, when you were there, was was Bill Gates walking the halls? Was it smaller <laughs> at that time or what? It what was, was that? it was a lot smaller and, and Bill was very funny. He was uh, a, an amazing nerd, brilliant, but amazingly nerdy. And, uh, and literally his staff had to pick out his clothes for him when he, when he would travel and put it in Ziplocs and label it <laughs> in a Monday um, because his head was just always somewhere else. But he, he, he really is brilliant. Amazing. So when you went to Harvard, did somebody write you a letter of recommendation? Like, were you thinking at that point, I really could use some help getting in here? Or was that, was, was it not like that? I didn't have time to pull together letters of recommendation. I, I had one from my manager, uh, okay. which I think was obligatory in the application, but, um, but no, I didn't, I, I really, I did it kind of on a whim. I, it, and I, in some respects, I'm glad because I, if I had decided I was going to apply in six months, I would have spent six months sweating over the application. And so it was sort of nice that I only had a week to do it. And while you were there, were you ever, did you feel like this is, I mean, I can imagine at that time, was it 50% women in class in, at HBS? Was it 20%? How many women were you in this? That's a good question. Women? I think it was about 30% women. Okay. Okay. There were, there were others. Probably not a lot of women in tech though at that time. No, no. So when you, when you were thinking about what you were going to do next and you said, thought to yourself, okay, I'm going to go back to the Bay Area. I want to be in tech. What did people understand what that meant? Like, were your <laughs> colleagues at school thinking, what tech, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the internet was just getting started. Um, and Netscape was, was out. Um, and so some people were starting to use the internet, but it was kind of a novel frontier. When I took the job at Yahoo, my mother thought it was the chocolate drink, Yoohoo. <laughs> That is hysterical. That's how little people knew about, about the internet. And it was, you know, a small company. It was, uh, they raised their first round of funding, $10 million from Sequoia in November. And I started in December. Um, and it was tiny. It was 30 people. We were all in one room. I actually started while I was still at business school. And I commuted back and forth. I did three days in San Francisco and then would take a red eye back and attend classes and, and went back and forth for the first several months until, until school was over in the spring. Wow. Okay. So Yahoo at that time you decide, okay, I'm wrapping up his goal. I'm going to go back. I'm going to join Jerry Yang and 30 of his colleagues and build what your mom thought was the chocolate drink. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no mom, it's called <laughs> Yahoo. Not you. <laughs> I used to love those you. And that I was going to, I was accepting a job at a company with an exclamation point at the end of its name. It was, it was not her stereotype of she was, she was, you know, had the vision that I was going to go into consulting or investment banking. And, you know, I want, I knew at that point I wanted to be in something more innovative and exciting. So I assume at this point you're still single. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. So you head back, Jerry offers you a job at, at Yahoo and says, what, here's your title. 30 people is not a lot of people. So what that means is you're wearing a few hats, but what, what was your hat? We, we just made it up as we went along. We were one big room. 
uh, there wasn't even a sign on the door. And, uh, and my first day, my manager wasn't there. I walked in and I said, where's, where's my desk? Somebody said, pick one. <laughs> You're kidding. It was really figure it out as you go. And so I was, again, product, a product manager, which was designing features and functions and thinking about what people might use the internet for, which back then, no one knew. We had a lot of hypotheses. Uh, some of them were right. Some of them weren't. We, we, one of my first projects was we, we had the, um, the theory that the internet was going to be too vast for people and too confusing and that people were going to want a local version of it. So we created Yahoo San Francisco, Yahoo New York, and Yahoo Chicago, um, thinking that people were going to want to think about the internet locally. It was absolutely wrong. Um, people don't define community by their zip code. They define community by a shared passion. And because mm -hmm. you can now be connected with all puppy lovers around the world, that could mm -hmm. be your community. We didn't, we didn't get that. So, you know, it was a lot of trial and error. That's amazing. So what was Jerry at that time? What was his vision? I mean, if he, he, he stood in front of you as 30 people in the organization and said, here's where I'd like to see us be a year, three years, five years. Did he have that kind of vision at that time? Um, you know, there, no, I, not that I know. Um, I think we were really kind of figuring it out. And we knew that we wanted to be um, a sort of, we started out as a directory. And you may remember that it was something you could browse. And we had a team of surfers who would find websites and put them into the hierarchy uh, so that you could logically browse through. And search was an afterthought. Search was something that we um, just considered a commodity and there were search companies out there and we would license it for a year at a time. So we would license from Alta Vista or we would license from you know, these, these search companies. Um, but really we were sort of trying to be a directory. We wanted to be your front page where you could go and get the highlights of information and then click through for more. Crazy, okay. And so at that stage, you, you started with Jerry and talk to us about kind of your, your money mindset. So you walk in the door, you're leave, you, you join, uh, you leave Harvard, you have an MBA and you join them and you're thinking financially, how am I going to make money? Were you, were you, did you have a money mindset at that point? Were you thinking at some point I'm going to make it? and it's gonna to be today down the road. Did you think Yahoo was a payout opportunity for you? Give us some insight into that. You know, at the time I had no idea. And again, it was sort of the eternal optimist in me that said, you know, it'll work out. And in fact, my starting salary at Yahoo was exactly the starting salary that I had at Microsoft when I graduated from college. So it was, which you can imagine, my mom had something to say about that too. Why did I pay for this MBA? Um, but I, but I had stock and I had a belief that what we were doing, I've always felt that if you create something really powerful, it'll monetize itself. There will sure, be a sure. way that it will be worth something. And so, um, I just believed in it that, you know, I could make it on my starting salary, even if I didn't get any upside and some, somewhere along the way, there would be upside that would, that would happen to me. And I really just didn't focus on the money. And so at the time, did you negotiate a financial package that included founder shares or was that just kind of part of the Sequoia package where it started at 30 people and they thought, you know, this woman's willing to start at her, you know, post undergrad salary rate. We're going to have to throw some shares in her house. <laughs> uh, yes, I did. I, I did get shares. That was a big part of the compensation. And I started before we had done our IPO. And so pretty quickly, I realized that the shares were going to be valuable. Our IPO was, was really spectacular and um, was one of the first. It, Netscape had done their IPO, but, um, but it was all, the internet was so new. And so pretty early on, I saw the value of the shares, even though they were locked up for a period of time, um, I knew that I was going to be fine financially. Cool. So, this so was on and it was a, I was able to just have fun with it. And Yahoo was so fun. And so was, did Netscape go IPO prior to you joining Yahoo or after you had already joined? Prior. Okay. So was that, I remember when they did go IPO and everyone was like, what is this Netscape thing? <laughs> <laughs> and really at that time, IPOs weren't really as prevalent, you know, and, and such a vehicle, right? That, right. Um, 
at least as an entrepreneur in some of these indie companies, that was definitely not the thing that we thought of. I mean, we thought of that mm-hmm. in a, I, I, I don't know about you, but at least at that time, all of a sudden, much like SPACs are today, you know, back then, it was just the beginning wave of mm-hmm. FIPO. And really, frankly, for me, I remember thinking, you know, salary is not nearly as important as getting shares. Right. Right. Because I started to realize, you know, I would forego an income at one point or as much as I would normally ask for in lieu of shares of, of, mm. of businesses that I really felt had potential. So it sounds I, like you made a good choice. In that. And, and the, you know, I agree with you that the IPO world wasn't as developed then. I'm looking back on it, surprised that we were able to go public because we didn't have a revenue model really. Jerry and Dave were pretty opposed to advertising. Um, and so we weren't, we weren't certain at all how we were gonna monetize this. There just was this fundamental belief that if we make something really cool, it will be monetized in one way or another. And the, the market was willing to agree with it. And we, we did experiment with advertising and at, it was none of the automated, you know, incredible advertising systems that we have today. It was manually done. And I'll never forget that the, the programmer took the image and then you know, put in what the link would be. And he, it was Honda, I think it was, a car company. And he didn't know what the web address was yet. So as a placeholder, he put www.xxx.com, you know, XXX as a placeholder, and then forgot. So w- when we launched our first ad, and it was a big deal, and we were, Yahoo's got advertising, and people went to look at it, they clicked on it, and it went to a triple X porn site. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> what did Jerry do? So we, we took it down fast and we are lucky that we didn't get sued out of existence. Um, but there was a lot of trial and error in the early days. That is amazing. So you were there and t- tell us a little bit about, I mean, because clearly you did very well and, and that initiated your, your first massive um, successful fin- financial successful payout. And, and that was a big, um, that was a, not only a great choice Yahoo, but a big, Pivotal, pivotal moment, it sounds mm-hmm. like, in terms of your own um, trajectory. But where, at what point, you know, where were you thinking? Because at that time, I think being as close to being an entrepreneur as possible was the stage in which you joined Yahoo, right? Mm-hmm. Even though you weren't Jerry with the entrepreneurial idea, you were there to execute his vision and his. So, what was that like for you after leaving a big company like Microsoft that was well established? Where did you find your footing and what, what was your vibe then around feeling like, wow, I can have, I have, I have latitude to build value here. So, you know, it really, um, Yahoo was, I was an entrepreneur in the sense that I was able to be entrepreneurial with the backing of Yahoo. And so, you know, you could start anything you wanted to back then. We, you know, I started Yahoo Travel, um, started, you know, Yahoo Shopping, um, and you just came up with an idea and designed it and put it out there. And we were all sort of, we had the freedom to experiment. And of course, it's not like software where it takes 18 months to iterate a, a, a release. You put something up and you know within 30 minutes, whether it's working, you can take it right back down. And so there was tons of freedom to do trial and error and experiment. And, um, and so I really had the opportunity to be creative and be entrepreneurial and, and start these new ideas. Um, and I got hooked. I loved it. I loved being able to uh, you know, visualize something and, and then figure out exactly how to design it and how to make it work. It was just electrifying. So talk to us, like this kind of amazing and mind boggling to me, because at that stage, the internet was almost like this DOS based, right? I mean, it was just so perfunctory and kind of pragmatic at that time. I remember, talk to us about this vision that you had for Yahoo Shopping. I mean, what other, <laughs> what other shopping sites were you thinking, gosh, I, I, you know, I looked at um, this shopping site and this shopping site, I have this big idea for Yahoo Shopping. So there were very few at the time. 
but there were also very few women at Yahoo. And so I was the girl who was saying, wouldn't it be cool if you could shop online? And uh, AOL was doing some experimenting with online shopping. Amazon existed, but it was only books. And CD Now existed, but it was just CDs. And Macy's was experimenting with just a couple of SKUs. They were pantyhose. Um, and so there's very, very little of it happening. But, um, but I, you know, I, I, I went to the guys and said, wouldn't it be cool if we did this and, and created a directory of all the shopping sites that exist. And um, I'll never forget uh, the guys saying to me, no, the internet is not, why would anyone want to shop online? It's the internet is for stock quotes, sports scores, and pornography, right? Yes, like, you know, that is nobody's going to put their credit card in and, and shop online. And, and do you remember, do you remember exactly who said that? Like, do you ever want to ping that person and say, hey, remember when we were sitting in the break room, which was also our conference room, which was also our work room? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember who it was. It was generally the theme and the board felt the same way and there was very little support. And I, I was able to get, um, Jerry agreed to let me do this little experiment and gave me half of the time of one developer. Said you could go figure it out. And luckily this developer was as passionate about the idea as I was. And, um, and we, I literally went and bought HTML for dummies and designed the front page myself. <laughs> I'm like, we can do this. We can do this. And there weren't very many links. There was Amazon and CD Now, but we had a little front page of Yahoo Shopping. And um, and I really believed that people were gonna, you know, it was gonna make lives easier. But it's also, you know, shopping for shoes is a little bit like pornography for women, right? It's still content. Totally. And and so sh the shopping experience, contrary to the way men think about shopping, it is actually a pleasurable media experience as well. That's amazing. So was there imagery? Were you able to put a picture of what you had envisioned to purchase? Or at that point, it was just links to where you could go to find it? There were pictures. There, okay. were, there were pictures. Okay. And there were some early tools um, that were starting to come in, certainly in the first year thereafter, where there was um, ComparNet, where you could compare prices between, between sites. So we did a, a strategic deal with them. And we did, um, there was a site called Impulse Buy Network that um, that would to give it, you know, promotional deals, you know, an impulse. Um, and so there were, there were other folks starting to experiment with e-commerce, but very few. And so through your, how many years were you at Yahoo in total? Four and a half. Okay. And so in those four and a half years, you would say you're learning around building something from nothing or from something from a big idea into something that's like, massive right like the world yahoo is like a q-tip or a coca-cola it has its own it has its it represents its own signature symbol right so in in looking back on that time that you were there did that inspire you even more to pursue being an entrepreneur and coming up and executing new and big ideas it, it really did. I, I, I really got hooked on the entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial process. And, and I started to learn a lot about myself, which was um, that, you know, I think about the, the starting of a company uh, on a continuum where there's the idea person who, you know, these idea people are brilliant and they're also a little crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And they can spew out a hundred ideas and I was never the idea person, but I was the next step on that continuum, which is I was the one who's not afraid of crazy people and would hang out with them and, and look through these ideas and say, now that one, I know how to do that and could make something be a reality and uh, hire for it and come up with plans and design it and, and, and bring it to fruition. And then, you know, by the time it was running and stable and needed bureaucracy and processes in order to scale, then I didn't feel as inspired anymore. And, mm. and so I became very self-aware about that. And it's why I left Yahoo because it was 3000 people, which to me just felt way too big. And we had budget plans and you couldn't just go start Yahoo greetings, you know, the way I did, you had to, you know, go through approvals and all these things. And, and I felt like my creativity was constrained and, um, and so I, I learned a lot about where I fit on that process and, 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 and how I wanted to be engaged with, 
uh, with companies. And, and how far into your time at Yahoo did they go into an IPO? Was it while you were there? Oh, almost immediately. And so in December and we did our IPO in, in April. And so did you, did you, what, in terms of your own economics at that point, could you, did you think at the time, gosh, I could, I could retire in the next three years and kind of hang up my hat and sit on a beach and drink my ties if I so chose. No way. No way. I was so <laughs> hooked. And, and really I had so much fun. Um, honestly, I mean, I would sleep under my desk often because we would put up a new feature and I would be dying to see how it, you know, how it worked and, and whether people used it. Um, and so I, you know, I, I was too addicted to the adrenaline. I don't think that I, uh, that I that never crossed my mind to, to retire. That's amazing. Okay. So at what point did you get married? Did you get married while you were there? I did not, but I was dating my then husband and it was one of the reasons that I left. He was running a uh, publicly traded company and uh, he was the CEO, but he wanted to step, step away and be chairman. And so he asked me to come run it with him. Uh, and so I left Yahoo to go take on a position as a CEO of a, of a little publicly traded company based in Canada. Wow. Okay. So learnings from that. Learnings from that are don't work with your husband. Hey, okay. <laughs> I, I vote for that. Okay. Um, it, it really was a strain on the marriage and, and, um, and certainly, but the other learnings were that I think I did that job for the wrong reasons. So I did it because, you know, I wanted to spend time with this man and because he wanted me to do it. Um, and so, but I had no passion for, it was a, it was, it was a conglomerate of, um, it was a, basically a private equity company that owned minority positions in several businesses. And none of which were things that I was particularly passionate about. It was commercial real estate. It was a parking company. Um, and, so I was there for the wrong reasons. And mm -hmm. while it was interesting to be the CEO of a publicly traded company, I knew right away it wasn't my passion. And, and was there, did you ever feel there was a stigma that said, oh, you're working with your husband or were you showing up at meetings? I mean, running a publicly traded company is no joke, right? That's kind of a big deal. Not a lot of women, I'm sure at that time were other peers that you could point to. Were you... Did you feel like, gosh, I'm the only woman in the room right now? Or were, did you ever kind of get the sense like, oh, okay, Elizabeth, you're, you're in the CEO role here because your husband's chairman. What, what was that like? Yeah, I was definitely the only woman in the room. There's no question about that. I never really got hung up about it. I don't think I really um, thought about it. You yeah. know, I had enough confidence and I knew um, you know, with my Harvard Business School degree and my experience, I had confidence that I could do the job. Certainly there would be, um, you know, in the back of my head, maybe I just got this job because my husband, get, you know, gave it to me. But, um, but I knew I was, I was up for it. And, and, um, and you know, that self-doubt and that um, kind of imposter syndrome, we all have it. And you, you just have to set it aside and believe in yourself. And, um, and luckily I'm, I'm able to do that. So, uh, and, and really the, 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 I was there for, um, for about six years and we, um, we privatized the company. We, we sold several of the businesses, used that money to buy in the shares, um, and, and buy the company entirely and then sold the remaining, uh, couple of businesses to management. So we exited in 2008. Um, and actually, ironically, also um, exited my marriage at that, at that time. Wow. Okay. And but had had kids during that period as well. That's correct. I had two children during that time. And I was living in San Francisco, although the company was based in Vancouver and Calgary. So a lot of travel um, with the children. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was it was it was pretty high pressure for sure. Oh my gosh. It's such high pressure, right? I mean, we don't have, that's, that's really, we underestimate what it takes to have kids and mm -hmm. run a company and be responsible for delivering public, publicly traded results, right? That's a big responsibility as well. That's a whole nother layer, right? So you right. privatize the company and you, you exit the marriage, you have two kids and you decided to pivot where? 
So I had actually, um, along the way, while I was uh, running this company, I had become uh, aware of and really enamored with the idea of microfinance. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the, the giving very small loans to the world's poor so they could start their own businesses. So, and really tiny loans, $500, $1,000, and, um, you know, I really loved, I loved it. I loved the idea of helping people help themselves, letting them build their own way out of poverty. And I think maybe because I had so much enthusiasm for entrepreneurship when I was at Yahoo, that I loved harnessing the power of entrepreneurship to solve the problem. And, you know, the poor are incredibly industrious. They're actually incredibly smart. These folks know how to, to, to build their own way. They just need the opportunity. So I'd become really interested in microfinance and had been supporting it philanthropically. And um, so I, but as I started to look at the industry, it was, it, it was obvious that m the vast majority of the microfinance organizations were 2000 borrowers or fewer. And there are no economies of scale to it. And they were all nonprofits. And as I started looking at it, I thought, why wouldn't you do this on a for-profit basis? These borrowers are repaying their interest in their loans. Uh, the organizations themselves are profitable. Why wouldn't you do this on a for-profit basis? And you could, you know, instead of asking somebody for a hundred dollar donation, I might get a hundred thousand dollars if you knew you were going to get your money back with a return. And with economies of scale, these organizations could actually charge lower interest rates. Hmm. So I started, um, I really, I, I, was starting to ask around about this in the industry. And um, I attended a board meeting of Grameen Bank, which is the big guy. They're the big, the big founding father of microfinance. And I started asking these questions. And the founder of uh, Grameen Bank, Dr. Mohammed Yunus, um, said, you know, it's unethical to make money while doing good. And mm. you know, you're supposed to make your money and then give it away. Mm -hmm. And then one of the other board members pulled me aside at the break and said, don't worry about the ethics. It's just not possible to make money while doing good. And I left that meeting determined. Uh, I, I left and I thought, you know, when somebody tells me it can't be done, there was something in me. It was my aha moment. I thought, yes, it can. And so I started uh, a little friends and family fund called the Dignity Fund and raised $10 million. It was really, this was way before impact investing. This was way before people thought about social entrepreneurship. So it was, it was really going out on a limb, um, but we invested in microfinance organizations and we, um, and we lent, lent the money on a for-profit basis. And it was amazing success. So, okay, so for those like this, this is a whole new world for me when you and I talked about this. So for those who really don't understand microfinance organizations and what it means to raise money and recognize that you can actually be for profit and make money and not be handed over to the foundation or the charitable side of a family office and say, oh, this is your, the charity side, you know, we don't really. So you're, you woke up and said, I have an idea. The women who need the sewing machine, the women who need, or the men who need the five hundred to a thousand dollar micro loan to go out and start their small, you know, independent business. Not only can I participate in that, but I can participate in that and make money doing it. And so, in your mind at that time, what was the vehicle to do that? Was that through a large finance organization that you were? imagining partnering with to do that? Or did you imagine I'm going to start my own fund? And then how do you find the woman who needs the $500 sewing machine? What was right. the whole process? And it, and it generally is women. Um, microfinance is, is, is largely to women. Men tend to have some sort of another form of employment. It tends to be women who are underemployed. And women are a much better credit risk. Women, um, and, and they take their loans seriously. They know it's sort of their their only opportunity. And we also find that women tend to take the proceeds from their, from their wealth and invest it in the children and in the household mm -hmm. and in education. Whereas generally men tend to drink it away or gamble it away. I'm stereotyping of course, but really women, um, a dollar in a woman's hand is nearly twice as powerful in terms of economic recovery 
than uh, than in a man's, and so in developing countries, and so it is primarily women. Um, so I, you know, it was it was sort of I had this hunch, and I really thought we could change the thinking that you make all of your money and then you give it away, and it was a new concept to say why don't we see if you can do both together. And um, so I, you know, I, I did it as a proof of concept fund, but I knew that my little ten million dollar fund wasn't going to change the world. I did that fund specifically to try to prove to others that you can and and should be thinking this way. So I started working with Deutsche Bank and bringing them along. And Deutsche Bank very soon after raised an eighty five million dollar fund for microfinance. And I was working with Citibank and trying to bring them along. And they, they created a whole division for microfinance. And so really, I feel like Dignity Fund was a success, not only because we helped 14 microfinance organizations grow exponentially and charge lower interest rates because of their economies of scale, but we brought in that kind of thinking into the industry. And today, the vast majority of money that goes into microfinance is for profit. That, you blow me away. Talk about, I mean, yes, you had your own financial successes and your own, you know, your own massive powerhouse success. But I mean, really, this is so game changing for the world, right? This idea that you had that said, hey, I bet you we can win win here. Mm. Let's figure out how to do this. I mean, and it was really, it was really hard for people to understand, you know, you alluded to the family offices, but I raised most of my money from high net worth individuals, friends, and they say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go along with this crazy idea of making money with my philanthropy. You know, that's the way people thought about it they didn't understand, like they, they were donating to microfinance. And so, but now I'm going to invest in it, which is head scratcher. And so they'd send me their investment team and the investment guys would say, no, 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 no. We don't do philanthropy. We have our, you know, portfolio balanced, you know, plan for the portfolio. We don't do philanthropy. So they'd send me the foundation and the foundation would say, no, 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 we don't do investments. Like nobody even knew how to do an impact investment in most of these family offices. The, you know, nobody had seen this before. And uh, so we had to do a lot of groundbreaking, that's for sure. Oh my gosh. And like, think about it today. I feel like there's just not even an, an opportunity to have a conversation with an investor without having a social impact or a give back component, right? It's kind of a table, it's kind of table stakes today to be able to think about how do you build and create a for-profit business that also has some sort of a give back or charitable component. Right. It's, it's key and it's key to your employees, right? It's key to recruiting, it's key to retention, it's key to vision. Yes. So the pivot for me um, was that once Dignity Fund was happening and I was realized that I was really onto something here, um, Dignity Fund was uh, wound up in 2008 which was also the year that I, that I left the uh, publicly traded company. We had privatized it. And it was also the year that I got divorced or separated. And so, um, so but Dignity Fund had been a huge success. And people were asking me, well, are you going to raise fund too? And I said, no, no, no. I, my little, I, me as little Dignity Fund and my, my wonderful um, friend and employee who has financial expertise, because I'm not a finance person. She was running the fund with me. Um, but, you know, we're not going to be able to bring the scale that needs to happen. But now that the big guys were coming in, um, you know, my job was to get out of the way and let them do it and be on their boards and encourage them. But I found myself being a spokesperson and an advocate and an evangelist for this idea of, of helping nonprofits think more like social enterprises and, and to bridge the, the gap between investing and, and doing good. And so I uh, joined a nonprofit on the board called Unitis, which was specifically helping microfinance institutions convert to for-profit status so that they could uh, take in for-profit investment dollars. And I chaired that board for a number of years and, um, and just became a spokesperson for the, for the idea. And now I've, I've never looked back. I've spent my whole, the whole rest of my career um, in impact investing in one way or another. I've run a number of funds um, and, I, and I spent a lot of time trying to help people think about merging these, these two extremes. You get big businesses that are becoming more socially responsible. 
their customers are demanding it. The millennials who work there are demanding it. And you're finding nonprofits getting really sick and tired of fundraising to make their make us payroll and to, you know, to help have them find ways to be sustainable and bring this together so that business fundamentally, it's not an impact business, but that all businesses have an impact. Mm. I'm, I mean, I have goose skin. It's like, so it's so it's, if you think about it, it's like, this is the metamorphosis. It's like the evolutionary kind of, trajectory of what it means to be centered in thinking about giving back, being present, um, having, having an impact, leaving a legacy, but also guess what? I want to make money Mm. and that's okay. You know, and I just think that, you know, transitioning an entire industry, really financial investing, an entire institution around the idea of let's not separate the two. Let's think about how we can incorporate this into a win-win is one of the things that I admire most about you because you're, you are such a problem solver. If I were to say one of your greatest superpower uh, capabilities, as I've gotten to know you is just, how do you think about, we have a huge social dilemma or social problem. Let's go solve for that. But by the way, I want to make money doing that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, aha, hello, you're going to get a lot of people who are a lot more excited about that. Right. So do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, I, again, goose skin, when I talk about how, what you're doing right now around homelessness, will you just describe your vision for what, what you see and what you're working on? Sure. Yeah. You know, homelessness is, is here in San Francisco and in California, you know, it's, it's been a real, it's been very heavy on my heart. I have to say it just breaks, breaks my heart to see so many people homeless. And I think we are um, a little immune to it at this point because we've become so used to it. Um, But, you know, there's a reason why home and security are the bottom of Maslow's pyramid, right? I mean, it's so fundamental for people to be able to to be the, the, their true self is to have the safety and security of a home. And um, so during the pandemic, it started to become very obvious to me that we've got a looming crisis that's gonna be crazy, right? So the numbers are incredible. So it, for instance, in Los Angeles County, there's 60,000 homeless as of now. And their prediction is that 120,000 families, not even individuals, but families, will become homeless for the first time in the next 12 months. So mm. triple what we're experiencing today. And mm. I think, you know, everybody's been looking at the virus and watching the news and the hospitals and maybe realizing that their favorite little local store or, or, or a restaurant is gonna close. But I don't think we really grasp the enormity of the homelessness crisis that is about to hit us when the eviction moratoriums start to expire. So I started looking at it and thought, okay, what can we do? As a business person, I'm going to, you know, learn as much as I can about homelessness and try to come up with a, a, a solution. And so um, we start, I put together a little uh, task force of members within YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And we just met regularly and brainstormed and looked into different ideas and options. Um, and then I just got really bitten by it. And so I started spending full time on it. Um, did a huge amount of sort of deep dive research. I, one of the beauties of the pandemic is Zoom. And I did over 130 30 minute Zoom calls with anybody who would take my call to just learn about what was happening in homelessness and why, even though we're putting more and more money into it, the problem keeps getting worse. And I, and I came up with some theories um, and I realized that um, budgets, my, my hypothesis was that budgets would be the problem, would be the constraint. They're really not. The constraint is people willing to raise their hands and be the project managers and pull things together to build sites. So nonprofits, existing nonprofits have their heads, their hands full with their existing mandates. Governments aren't the ones who are going to go build new sites. Uh, and existing developers, for-profit developers won't find it, you know, to be lucrative. And so Uh, So I started a little social enterprise called Dignity Moves that is uh, building 
really redefining what we call shelter. And um, we are, you know, I should take a step back and think about it from the lens of, of a very personal lens, which is that, you know, these people who are about to experience homelessness for the first time, these are real people. They're not hypothetical people. And I have a close friend who um, lost his job at the beginning of the pandemic. And after a couple months, couldn't pay rent and lost his apartment. And he came and stayed with me and was sleeping in my son's bedroom until my son, my son's boarding school closed and my son had to come home. As much as I love my friend, I love my son more. And uh, I had to ask him to leave. And luckily he was able to move in with a brother, but he had to move to LA, which is not ideal because his relationships are here. And it became very real to me. Like, where does somebody like that go? Who's got a master's degree and, you know, and, and business skills. They're not going to sleep in a congregate shelter on cots with strangers. Right. right? You need to have okay. dignified places for these people and families to go. So we've kind of redefined how to build really rapidly built manufactured um, units that are the size and shape of a shipping container so that they're portable, so that we can use land that might only be available for a few years, but they're all divided into individual rooms. So everybody has their own room with a door that locks. And I think that's really critical. For, are, you re, are you refurbing shipping containers? Or are you building these from scratch? We're building them from scratch. Um, although we've done, we've experimented with a couple of different formats. So we were kind of on this idea. We were researching different manufacturers. We were networking around the, mic, the, mic, the, the homelessness industry. When um, I got a phone call from a woman who um, is at the mayor's office of housing in Los Angeles. And she told me about the project home key program that the state was doing. It had a big budget to buy hotels that had been used during shelter in place for the homeless. And she said, you know, nothing in this says that it has to be for hotels. It just says that the money has to be spent by the end of the year. And there's, you know, obviously you're not gonna build a building in California in that time, but we can with our pre-manufactured units. And so um, one of the organizations that I'd really fell in, fallen in love with during the exercises I've been going through in my networking is called Life Moves in Silicon Valley. They're an excellent services agency. So Life Moves and I uh, put our heads together and said, let's apply for this money. And um, we literally, one of the Life Moves board members went online and found a, a, a piece of land that was available for sale. It happened to be in Mountain View. So we called Mountain View and said, do you wanna apply? And we had 72 hours before the deadline. Reminds me a little bit of applying to HBS. We scrambled and Life Moves and the city of Mountain View submitted an application. And, and we got the funding. So we're building our first site in Mountain View for 130 beds. And we're using four different manufacturers. One of them is actually refurbished shipping containers, but you know, we're sort of agnostic about who the manufacturer is. It's just the concept of rapidly deployed, pre-manufactured private rooms that, you know, where we can really do this at scale. And, so now we've started Dignity Moves. I didn't set out to start a social enterprise. I really just set out to raise my hand and say, I'm here to help. But I've, now that I see where the need is, we're starting a little company and it will be for profit. We will charge fees um, and that will allow us to scale. And we're making ourselves available to cities and counties across California and saying, we know how to do this. Let's do more of it. Wow. Holy smokes. <laughs> and that was just during the pandemic over the last nine months. Been so I've been a little busy uh, just coming up with the problem solve for homelessness. All raising two teenagers. Right. But like, that's the, the key, like the need you saw that was missing is there's no one to, that's so smart and business savvy to project manage the execution of deployment of these funds to solve this issue. There's this bridge in the middle that's missing, right? And it's bringing together the execution of who's gonna supply the house, who's gonna execute on the, the deployment of it, who's gonna oversee and manage it, who's going to, right? Yeah. So it's like, 
that's a new business. You just have to pull it, pull it all together. And now we're in conversations with several other cities and counties. Um, and we're hiring our little team of project managers who know how to help find a site and understand the emergency shelter codes and the, uh, in, in the California building codes and knows how to project manage the general contractor and just build these and then work with the most important is working with great services agencies who can provide the help that these people need. So, um, you know, the first and foremost, you're never going to rebuild your life if you, you know, can't have a shower and Wi-Fi. I don't know how my friend would job search without, you know, without an internet, right? So right. They, these folks need a safe place to go and private and dignified, but then they need, they need help, right? So job placement experts and probably some mental health experts and, and some, you know, and folks who know how to apartment hunt and know all the tricks on, on Craigslist and all the rest, right? And so the services agencies are, are really the important piece. We're just providing the capacity and the space where they can do their magic. It's amazing. You blow me away. I'm so impressed. And the world is becoming every day a better place because you problem solve some of these things that are kind of like a big deal. <laughs> Thank you. It's amazing. Um, so I think one of the other things that I would love to just ask is through this process, do you have any, do you wake up every day and think about, do you have like moments where you say, I'm not sure I want to do this today and stay in bed. Do you have like any success secrets or tips that says, this is how I keep my, my energy level at a, at a 10 to continue to do this at this pace? You know, I'm, I'm really energized when I'm with other people. I'm yeah. an extrovert and I get my energy from, from others and I'm aware of that. And so I feel like I do my best thinking out loud. And so I, I spent a lot of time brainstorming with people and just talking it through and, and the new ideas and the new directions tend to come when I'm, when I'm talking it through. And so um, I have a great forum within YPO. I have this task force of, of YPO members who are all focused on homelessness who are, who were working together on this project. Um, and, you know, like those 130 Zoom calls, just talking it through with people, the ideas come and it, mm -hmm. and it keeps me really energized. And it gives me the reassurance that I'm, that I'm on the right path and I'm not completely crazy. Totally. Um, and, you know, and the other thing is that I didn't, you know, I didn't set out to, to build a, to become a, a real estate developer in homelessness. I, I, I set out to solve a problem and there's been some angst for me, which is, you know, is this really what I'm going to spend my career doing? And the answer is probably no, but I can still give myself permission to do something I'm passionate about for some period of time. So my vision is I'll run this for 12 or 18 months, build it so that it can be self-sustaining, get mm -hmm. several sites built and have some success and hire a CEO to run it. And I can be on to the next thing. So mm -hmm. I know right where I am in that continuum of you know, t taking an idea and, and creating something sustainable with it and then let someone else take it to the next level. You're amazing. You're amazing. So um, I really just admire you so much. And I, I think if any woman who's listening to this, who's an entrepreneur and kind of finding herself struggling or frustrated, what would you say to her? If you could reach out and say, you know, think about this or do this or read this book, anything that you would give her some advice? I think, I think my secret is tapping into my optimism. And sometimes when there is something that is absolutely the worst it could be, I challenge myself and say, no, where's the silver lining in this? There mm -hmm. is a silver lining. And, and I feel like when times are at their worst and when there's disruption in your life or in the world, that creates opportunity. And so rather than, than lulling on the bad that is there, find where the opportunity is in it. Find your optimism and say, no, there is something good about this. There is something good about this. And gratitude lists do wonders for me. And I look back on them and think, you're right. I should be grateful for that. And uh, so, so finding your inner optimism and, and believing in yourself, the constraints that we put on ourselves are only what we've put on ourselves. We, the imposter syndrome is just a syndrome. You, you can do anything that you want. And I think people hold themselves back and say, well, I don't have any experience in that, or I don't have the degree that I need. I don't have any experience as a real estate developer, but I can do it. 
Right. I can find the right people who do. Right. I know how to pull the right expertise together. And, and the passion is really the thing that is the secret sauce. Right. I think it's so true. I think what you're saying is so key. Your internal talk track, the way you speak to yourself, whether or not you think, oh my goodness, I don't have any expertise in homelessness. I've never been homeless. I have a beautiful home. I don't know anyone who's homeless. How can I be in the homelessness business? It's like, no, actually, you know, I, I, there's a problem to solve and there has to be a way. And the approach of, I don't know what I don't know yet. So I'm going to get on 130 Zoom calls and I'm going to talk for 30 minutes to, to people who have done this their whole life. And, you know, after I'm done with 130 Zoom calls, I'll decide if there's a there there, right? Like yep. it kind of sounds like that's the first step. Yep. And, and if you weren't in, of means and in, had your, the, all these successes that you have had already that allowed you the freedom to do that on your off hours, if you're thinking about starting a business or just in the beginning stages, you could have had a day job and be supporting your family and doing those 130 Zoom calls before and after work. Right? Absolutely. It's like, Absolutely. I have a vision for this. I'm going here. I think this there's, I think there's an opportunity. I'm not sure. And while I'm in my day job, paying for my overhead and my lifestyle and all the things I need, I'm going to go figure this out. Yep. Right. Out of the trapeze, the trapeze analogy where you're holding onto one and you don't let go until you, you, you know, you can reach the other, but you don't let go of this one too soon. Right. I mean, so it's absolutely fine to have your day job and have that security and be hanging on while you're researching and figuring out whether there's a there there. Um, and then jumping when you, when you know it's, it's going to work. Yeah. I'm so inspired. Elizabeth, I adore you. I love knowing you. You fired me up. You give me goosebumps. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you're a powerhouse. And you're so, like, you're an amazing, amazing. So um, is there a way anyone can track you, follow you? Do you have social handles, uh, a way people can connect if they want to know more? Absolutely. So I'm Elizabeth Funk, F-U-N-K. I'm on um, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. Um, or my email is Elizabeth at dignityfund.com. Cool. Thank you so much for your time and your heartfelt, le your heart led leadership and the impact you're making on the world, the impact you're making on entire industries blows me away. And I love calling you a friend and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for what you're doing, helping inspire women to be entrepreneurs and to believe in themselves. Yeah, this is it. This is what it's really all about. I wish, I wish I had had a you. 20 years ago when I decided to start this journey on the entrepreneurial journey, right? It's like, I wish in hindsight, the more we have one another to, you know, to resource and to lean on and to be inspired by. Yes. Makes an impact. Yes. All right. I'm happy to be a part of it. This is fantastic. Thank Thanks. you. All right. Have a great day. All right. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to From Potential to Powerhouse, Success Secrets from Female Leaders with your host, Tracy Holland.